evening. Let's, uh, um, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to Nahum, Nahum, chapter 1. And with the other finger, go to 2 Kings, chapter 18, verse 17. And then we're going to go somewhere else. So we have a lot of fingers ready for tonight. Uh, my, 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 my goal is to finish chapter 2 of Nahum today. Let's see what happens. Maybe, maybe not. Nah, Nahum, Nahum, chapter 1, verse 11. <clears throat> a lot of pages turning, that's good. I don't know how many of you all have them digital Bibles. I can't hear them turning. <laughs> they, are, they are good, but you don't always hear them turning. And so am I. I still, need, I still need to feel paper between my thumb and fingers. Let's pray. Father God, what a gracious opportunity we have as a body of believers to come together to look into your... Uh, prophecies within the book of Nahum to look into what we call the Old Testament, what you refer to as the Hebrew canon of Scripture, Father. As we do so, we want, your, uh, if anything, for you to be glorified. We want to know you better. Uh, and that's how Nahum started this book, with an understanding of who Yahweh is, who this Lord is. And help us to keep focused on that throughout this book, that you're a God who deals with things, a God who addresses the nations and the individuals alike. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, what we left off with last week, and I started getting into it, and it's, you know, kind of sometimes it gets to the point you get tongue-tied when you're speaking too much. So I want to kind of go back on this a little bit and refresh your memories a little bit. We're dealing with the prophecies of Nahum in chapter 1. We're talking about, again, uh, the Syrian Empire, the evil that it is being dealt with, and that God is dealing with them. And in verse 11, it says, From you has gone forth one who plotted evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. And I made you at that time go to uh, first, I believe what we did, we were in Second Kings chapter 18. And I want you to look at verse 17. So I'm going to change gears and I'm going to walk up here. I want to show you something. Uh, within this, um, oh, I, oh, I had it all planned. Okay, let's do it this way. <sighs> so, and I told you that this evil guy was Rabshakeh. S- 2 Kings eighteen seventeen gives us the historical account behind some of the things going on at this time with the Assyrian Empire and the kings of Israel. So we're looking at the historical account, not the prophecy. So we're getting a little background by going back to 2 Kings. And this... Obviously, it's not going to read like your version. The reason I have it up here is this is how it reads um, in the Hebrew, if you're reading Hebrew. Um, Obviously, Hebrew would be right to left, but for this case, since this program is built so we can be English readers, it reads reads normally uh, left to right. But I want you to see um, what's referred to as far as the leadership of the Assyrian army. It has three names here, the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh. You see those? Um, th- those aren't names. The reason is I say they're not names, if you could see the key of all three of them, the common ground is the word et. Et means, you can see it real easy here, the way it, this program works. Et is the word the. So they, they didn't include it in here. Um, so we've got to find out who these people are. Uh, what's being, what I believe is being referred to in Nehum is this guy, Rabshaka. Rabshaka, if you were to tr- translate it, is, he's the propaganda expert. He's the PR guy. Um, he's the one uh, that was the counselor to the king. The, w- what's recorded is he harangued the Jews of Jerusalem. Um, he helped aid to ridicule the king of Judah. It, it, it's, it's believed... Um, through enough scholars, I guess, is they came to the point that this guy was a Jewish... The guy that filled this position at the time was a Jewish man who had defected from Israel. And his title that he was given at the time was the Rabshaka. Uh, he, the title was... It's a title. All three of these are titles, and we'll talk about them for, in a minute. But all three of these being titles. we got to look at this. In this case, he probably is, in this case, the cupbearer, the chief spokesman... 
He's always at the right hand of the king, so he counsels. He has the king's ear, basically. Being the cupbearer, don't just think of somebody saying, oh, you want something to drink and taste it first and hand it to him. What it basically says, uh, I think we have something like that today, political chief. Politi- no, for the president, it's chief of staff, the, politi- politi- uh, the political guy that that's, does this. I think that's what it's talking about. As we look at the, let's just go this way. Let's look at El Tartan is basically the, the ch- commander of the army. He's their general. So you can see uh, when it's talking about he sent out the king of Assyria, he sent out the general. And then we have the Rapsaris, and he's um, like the head officer. I know general sounds like head officer, but they're different statuses of officers. Uh, it, we can call this guy almost the, the commanders of the army under the king, and then this guy is the commander under him, and the other guy is the chief counselor. Why do we look at this? Why do we need to understand that? Because we need to know this guy is the evil of the empire. Uh, what makes him evil? Look, well, let's look at Isaiah for a second. Hold your finger in Second. Ki- well, you don't have to hold. We're not going back to Second Kings. It's on the board. Go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 36. And remember what I said, Isaiah and Nahum kind of, there's a lot of things in common that they have, different things that are going on. But um, in, second, in Isaiah 36, it also ta- addresses the Rabshaka. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I guess we could start in verse 2. Um, and, and the king of Assyria sent Rabshaka from Lachish, to Jerusalem, to King Hezekiah with a large army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway of the fuller's field. Then Elikim, the son of Helikiah, who was over the house of Shebna, the scribe, and Joha, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. Then Rabshakeh said to him, Say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what is the confidence That you have, I say, your counsel and strength for the war are only empty words. Now on whom do you rely that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed, even on Egypt, on which if a man leans, he will go into his hand and pierce him. So So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who rely on him. In other words, be careful who you make your alliances with. But if you say to me, Rabshaka, we trust in the Lord. It is not he whose high places and and who uh, altar Hezekiah has taken away and who has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, we shall worship before this altar. Now, therefore, come and make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. And I will give to you 2,000 horses if you're able to, uh, on your part, to set riders on them. How then can you repulse one official of the least of my master's servants and rely on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen. And, and, have, uh, and have I now come up with, without the Lord's approval against the land of, to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So he's falsely identifying himself, if you can see what's going on. Then El- 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 Elikim and Shebna and Joha uh, said to Rabshakeh, Speak now to your servants in Aramaic. For we understand it and do not speak to us in Judean in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. So basically, this guy knew multiple languages and he could basically bridge the gap between the Assyrians and the Hebrews at this time. And he's making up these deals that are going on. But Rabshakeh said, has my master sent me to only your master and to speak to those words and not to the men who sit on the wall, doomed to eat their own dung and drink their own urine with you? Uh, Very graphic. Um, but that is what it is. And then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in Judean, in the Hebrew tongue more than likely, uh, or at least a dialect of it. Uh, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. So Assyrians had their language. This guy was a very good emissary, I guess you could say that, who was very defective in and of himself, and he was making these deals with them. So going back to Nahum, and let's see how this kind of looks now that we've seen the historical account, let's kind of plug it in. Um, which is interesting because as we're dealing this, as we're going back to Nahum, we're talking about the cupbearer and the true cupbearer in the Bible, the one that's known for his cupbearer uh, ability was Nehemiah. Remember Nehemiah? You know what Nehemiah's name is? It's Nahum and God put together. It's Nahum, 
comfort, we have the God of what? Comfort, that's Nehemiah. So, but it, there's a big difference in cupbearers, isn't there? Nehemiah wanted to go back. He asked and begged the king to go back to help build Jerusalem and establish that. And here we have a guy that, um, if anything, he's a sheep in wolf's clothing uh, coming from Assyria into Israel and, to, and addressing them in their own language. You know what that does, right? It gives a level of comfort to the people to say, oh, we understand him. He's, he's, he's got to be thinking out for our best interests. Um, these, these known things of war. Um, remember this whole thing, though, cause as we began Nahum, it is, go back to verse 1, chapter 1. I just kind of set the stage for where we're going um, a little bit again. Um, now remember, at this time, the hatred for the Jewish people, the hatred for their king, and the hatred for their God is, is really at the height of, of this Assyrian kingdom. And it says, the oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkasite. Again, when it says the oracle, we could think this is a burden against or, or dealing with uh, uh, Nineveh. It's a, it's a message of, of a burden that's being brought forth to them. Um, in the Old Testament, there's many places that they're oracles. It's interesting, Isaiah, the book that's like akin to this, has 11 separate oracles addressed to different nations within it. So you've got to say, okay, Nehemiah, Nahum's got one, Isaiah's got 11, so he's got a what? A different burden, obviously, to deal with and to unload. Um, but Romans chapter 3 talks about an oracle that we have, too, that these oracles are given to these people, to, to Israel, to bear to the world. It was to what? To be a light that shines out into the world about their God, how their God was different, and how, what they were given. So when we look at these oracles, don't only think of them as a burden, don't only think of them as a message, but think of them as something that was pay, paving the way for the God of Israel to give that light out to people in a different uh, in different factions in different ways. And, and here we have a prophecy that's been given, a straightforward doom and gloom for Nineveh. Look at verse, tw- uh, go, to, go back to Nineveh chapter 1, verse 12. So I'm going to move along as far as our exposition does. Nehemiah, what? Name, what? Nineveh, chapter 2. Oh, just kidding. Go to Nahum chapter 1, verse 12. Nahum. Chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and likewise many, even so they will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no longer. So here's what the Lord says. Uh, God states that there is a day of reckoning for Nineveh. At at this point, Nineveh represents the whole Assyrian Empire. So there is a day of uh, accountability, a payday that's coming. Um, They are full strength and many. So what we basically see is at this particular time, um, there's two things really going on. When they say they're full strength and many, that means they've hit the the apex of their empire. They're large, they're huge. And obviously since they've gathered in so many people, there's many of them. But when you look at that too, the odds are in their favor, right? If you were going to say, okay, we're going to take on Assyria, the Assyrian Empire is going to take on little Israel at the time, it, it, it would be, uh, the odds are so much in their favor. Because, again, uh, people look at numbers, right? Don't we have a propensity to look at numbers and say, okay, or size? You know, my 10 against your 10 kind of thing, but your 10 are, wow, so much bigger, so much stronger, so much faster. But we forget that Israel is God. And God fights their battles. Um, and God allows at this time, God has allowed Assyria. Remember where we're at. We're, we're in Nahum where God has already dealt with the northern kingdom by using Assyria to scatter them, to deal with them in discipline. And Assyria has grown. And when you grow in size and, and volume of people, let me tell you some of the things that happens. First of all, your confidence is is. It's almost to the point, probably to the point and over the point of arrogance. I, I can't be defeated. Um, we can't be beat. I remember, I don't know what year it was, but when the New England Patriots matched the Dolphins, they were undefeated and they were going into the Super Bowl. You said, they won. That's a given. Nobody could stop them. They lost the Super Bowl, an undefeated season, but they lost because they had super confidence. This is beyond that. Um, 
Here's the advantage Assyria had. I like to talk about advantages, so let's look at their military advantages. First of all, they had numbers. You, when you can amass a large number of fighting troops, you have superiority. So we can say they came out with, the, with numbers. When they went into a battle, their rank stayed intact. They lost very few. So they had experience. You know, you ask somebody how long they've been in the military of Assyria, they wouldn't say, oh, I've just joined up 15 days ago. They could say, I've been here for years. Assyria had ruled for centuries. Not just been a country. We could say America's been a country for 200 plus years, yay. But they had been a world-dominant empire for centuries. Think of that militarily. Isn't that great? So they have the numbers, they have the confidence, they have the ranks that are intact. Their artillery was some of the best. When you talk about ordnance, how do they match up? What, what was their firepower? Um, they also had time on their side. Militarily, you think, okay, listen, we've got the odds in our favor right this minute, let's go, let's attack. And, and Syria just said, we can wait. We can wait this out. We can... We can starve them out. We can surround them and do whatever we want. Uh, we, we, when something like that happens, they would cause famine within a, in a nation. They, that ranking around them, their surrounding of them, nerves would snap. Nerves would be frayed. People would make mistakes in those kind of arenas when you're having uh, conflict and, f- and warring with one another. Um, you make mistakes sometimes, and that mistake is an opening for somebody else. Um, since they would have famine because they could snuff out what they would be available to come in as far as food, disease would also uh, escalate. And they could say, okay, the time has come. Uh, We've waited this long. People have died from disease and famine and um, maybe knocking off each other because of the frayed nerves. Uh, But the Bible warns us how many times pride cometh before the fall. Uh, but this book is constantly telling us that God is going to deal with them. Uh, notice what it says in the middle of verse 12. They will be cut off and pass away. Uh, that's when God is bringing that forth to you and you say you will be cut off and pass away. Take those words very seriously. Uh, this prophecy gave a partial fulfillment in one night where the avenging angel of God snuffed out 185,000. That's a significant loss. I don't know if you think about that, but that's a significant loss. Uh, nobody from Israel picked up any armament. Nobody was fighting for Israel at that point. It was just God finding a way to snuff them out. And this brought, um, if we went back to Isaiah, uh, you can even write this down if you want, Isaiah 37, 30, verse 36 and 37. They were supremely alarmed at what had just happened. Kind of think about this. You 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 have armies in the field, and all of a sudden, one hundred eighty-five thousand of them are dead, and you can't figure out why. What's the why? You know, I mean, I don't know if they have a a, a field me that goes out there and says, okay, this guy's cause of death was this, this guy's cause of death was that, and this, and what would be the bottom line that they would come up with? What would be the the field recovery as they went through each one of these one hundred eighty-five thousand? Said, why did they die? Well, you can't say cause of death, God. Cause of death, God. Sometimes we say act of God but because we don't know what to do with it. But this was an act of God because the Bible records it as such. Verse 13. Verse 13 says this, So now I will break his yoke bar from upon you and will tear off your shackles. Uh, no longer was Judah the vessel state of Assyria. The, the bond would be broken. No more payments to leave them alone. They were, at this particular time, Judah was paying, the southern kingdom was paying, uh, I guess, extortion to Assyria to kind of leave them alone. Um, but God saw no more would that happen. I, I will tear off your shackles. This was the beginning of the end for Assyria. Especially, remember we said we started with Sennacherib. He was the king at the time this prophecy was going out. His son, Asher Banapal, would, be, would rule uh, over Judah next and rule over the kingdom next, but that grant, but the, the the effect of that would be lost, short-lived, and then his son would take over, and then his kingdom would be gone. So it's very short-lived. Um, it's 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 interesting when God says that person and that kingdom will no longer bother you. I will deal with that. 
Um, Assyria was at last, on their last lap of being a glorious kingdom. Um, think about that ramifications for today. Think of people that have put their trust and faith in a, in a national entity and, ha- and think in your lifetime, how many nations have come and gone? How many new nations have propped, cop, cropped up and disappeared? And, and if we said, if I were to uh, superimpose my geography lessons as a kid on somebody today and say, here's the countries I had, and look at these countries, and they would say, what are you talking about? What, those aren't even countries today. Um, so the, the geography, uh, the face of the map changes, the names change often. Um, because why? They come and go. God's, God sees that it's done, and at some point... God's going to deal strictly with certain nations. But as we look at this, um, Assyria was given the chance. Again, I'm going to kind of go back and forth to Jonah once in a while. Assyria was given this wonderful chance by Jonah to repent, to keep that status of of God being near God and understanding what Jonah was so reluctant to tell them. And they kind of shaped up for what? (laughs) I, we don't even know how long that lasted because this is about 100, 150 years later, and we see this, how they, God has now said, we're done. Um, you know, we always say God is a God of second chances and other chances, and we don't know how many chances, but there is a time where God says, that's it. That's it. There's a payday. Um, I, I, what also comes to my mind when I see this, I, I also think of Joshua, who's like, I like Joshua. In the midst of the crisis he was going on and things that were happening around him and, and the, the f- fluctuating worship of people to go to God so quickly, he said, choose who you will serve. As for me in my house, which is kind of interesting because that means he was in charge of his house, we will serve the Lord. Um, we don't see that mantra coming from Assyria. They've lost Um, And at this time, they are very much idolatrous again. Um, Verse 14 talks about the personal doom to the reigning king of Assyria at that time, which is Sennacherib. Verse 14 says, The Lord has issued a a command concerning you. It becomes very personal. Concerning you. Uh, Your name will no longer be perpetuated. I will cut off idol and image. From the house of your gods, I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. I know it doesn't sound like strong words to us, but they are very strong words. Uh, and, and a lot of this has to do with the attack of by Sennacherib 17 years before he died. And that's recorded in 2 Kings 19. And I really don't want to go for that, but I want to go to that. You can write down 2 Kings 19. But um, what I want to look at is it's, some of the verbiage in here is very interesting because he says, no longer be perpetuated. Um, your name will no longer be perpetuated. Uh, at this time, he said this, so you can be clear on this, his name would be passed down to only two more because they were already alive. His son and his grandson were alive, and that's all that would ever reign in that, that national entity ever again. Um, and what happened was, it was a vile seed that plagued the world, and this and God made sure that this dynasty, this evil dynasty, would go straight into extinction. Um, later, it's recorded that when Alexander the Great took his massive army through this area, he didn't realize he was trampling over over the kingdom of Assyria because they had so been they they had been like God says here in verse. At the end of verse 14, I will pair your grave. That, that city, the main part, Nineveh, was laid waste and buried. And buried, um, which is kind of interesting, because when God says something, he carries it through to the absolute T. Remember, God can't be partially prophetic. He's got to be 100% all the time. So when he says something, I, I, it, they're in a grave. Um, I've, I've said this before, when they were dug up in 1846, they were dug up. <laughs> so they had to uh, uh, go down and get them out of the grave that God put them in. It says, idol and image were cut off. Um, it's interesting sometimes the irony you, say, you see. Um, but what they were warned about in Jonah 
caused their demise. Jonah says, you need to stop this. You need to come to the Lord. You need to stop this idolatrous effect. And what, what it did them in. And, bear, and, and, the word, and just think of this word when God says, um, you're contemptible. God announces that. You're contemptible. I don't know about you all. That's a pretty bad place to be. Um, verse 15 is, uh, it, it, this is an interesting way it's set up. In the Hebrew Bible, this is the first verse of chapter 2. This is not, and again, I say sometimes we've got to overlap and see things differently. Um, I think it's interesting. Sometimes in the Bible you have the last verse of a chapter that really closes that, first, that chapter off and begins a new chapter. So we really don't know what to do with it. And versification in chapters were, uh, it's not, this was not written into the text. So it's man-made kind of thing. And when we look at it, we say, well, is it the first verse of chapter 2? Does it, does it keep the continuity of chapter 2? Or does it keep the flow of chapter 1? Well, let me read it to you. And it kind of almost stands alone. Um, and, and it may sound very familiar to many of us. It says, Behold, on the f- mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, Celebrate your feasts, O Jew, to pay your vows, for never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. Now, the very first part of that verse, we can find in many places. Um, just Let's look for just a few seconds. Let's go, uh, go to Isaiah, and we're going to look at Isaiah in a few places. Uh, go to chapter 40. Isaiah, hold your finger in Nahum, we'll be back. Go to Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 9, Isaiah 40, verse 9. Now, it has many implications, but as you look at verse 9, it says, Get yourself up on, the, on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. And it's Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Why? Because um, what, what the city was all about, we can go into it for. Uh, eons of time, but city rep- that city represented this, the place of salvation. Okay, and what are you going to do? You're going to you're going to lift up good news. Okay, what was Israel to to do to be a light to the nations? So then it goes on to say, lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem. So it's repeating it a different way. Bearer of good news. Uh, just think, what is the good news? The gospel message, isn't it? What was Israel supposed to be doing? They were supposed to be the ones that got the message out. And instead of getting it out, they kept it in. And it goes on. He says, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Isn't that kind of neat? That's great news, isn't it? Well, Isaiah has more. Go to chapter 52. Isaiah 52. You know, think about it. What are your feet supposed to be doing? Taking you places. Taking you taking this message in various places. Verse 7, Isaiah 52, verse 7, says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of Him who brings good news, who announces what? Peace. Man, you're talking to a nation that never had what? Peace. And if you say, well, have peace, how do they have peace? And brings good news of happiness, whom announces what? Salvation. There's your peace. Who says to Zion... Your God reigns. Those are powerful words, isn't it? It wouldn't make a great song, wouldn't it? <laughs> Wish I was a songwriter right there. Your God reigns. Um, think of that news. As they would hear this through the mountains. Remember what mountains do. They help carry the, the volume. They carry the sound. Um, think of that Christmas song, I guess. It's, it's, I don't know if it's really Christmas. Go tell it on the mountains. Where do they get that from? Uh, uh, yeah, we always think of Christmas, but it's not really Christmas, is it? I don't know. We can go tell it on the mountains when it's not Christmas, can't we? Obviously, that's what's being said here. What? We should. We should, yes. Very good. We should. Isaiah 61. 
a, a really fabulous part of Scripture because this is what Christ read in the synagogue when Christ opened up the scrolls. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen what a scroll looks like uh, of Scripture. They weren't one scroll of all the Scripture. Each scroll contained its own section of Scripture. So whatever this scroll was, it contained Isaiah 61. Jesus opened up in the synagogue. He opened it up right up to 61, and he read this. Um, you always got to think, if he is the God of gods, and he understands biblical exposition, and they didn't have verse, you'll remember, they did not have versification, so he's opening up to what we know as Isaiah 61. What was it in the scroll? Who knows? Okay? And he gets to 61, which we know is 61.1, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord, uh, God is upon me. Hmm. Now Jesus is reading this. Kind of picture this. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he stopped. And if you're a good Bible teacher, wait a second, he can't stop in the middle of a verse. He can't do that. Yeah, because read the next part, he says the day of vengeance of our God. That's another time period. He was dealing with where he was at when he was reading this in the temple, and he wanted to give the message that this is me. I'm here to proclaim the good news. I'm here to to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. I'm doing it. And how is he doing it? By what he was doing by going to the cross. Curiously, go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse 14. So in the midst of this understanding, remember Romans 9, 10, and 11 have to deal with Israel. Israel's past, present, future. So we're kind of in the part where it's Israel's past. And in verse 14 it says, How then shall they call upon him in whom they had not believed? How, then, how shall they believe in him who have they not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach Unless there is sent, just as it is written. Now Paul goes back into the Hebrew Scriptures and he says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good news. So not only is Jesus the one who brought the good news, we bear the good news of what Jesus has done by getting that message out. And that's what's reflected here. So with that mindset, let's go back to Nahum chapter 1. Yeah, chapter 1, verse 15. And let's kind of look at this verse a little bit um, and glean something, because I really think this is the, uh, a f- one of those capstones of the book, because it came in a, almost an untimely place. We've talked about the demise of Assyria. It's been announced. We'll, in chapter 2, we'll get the details of it. And in chapter 3, we'll see what caused it. And, and that God dutifully did what he had to do because it was a necessity. But verse 15 kind of says, how did that happen? How do we get in this, in this place of good news? Um, and if you think about it, at this moment, what was the good news? If it says, behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news. What's the good news at this point? See, Nahum's not talking about this moment. He's pointing down the road. He's looking towards a time after the Assyrian uh, empires collapse, after the Babylonians come in and take over, after the Babylonian empire is, is then collapsed, and the Roman empire comes in at some point after the Greeks and all that Mishigas going on there. And then, the, then the Romans come in, and then Jesus comes, and he says, there's good news coming. In the midst of all this thing, understand that God has a plan And that plan is saying, yes, there's good news. No longer immediately to be bothered by Sennacherib. No longer are the hordes of the Assyrians coming. But the real peace comes when the Prince of Peace comes. You'll have peace. But you know what happens with that kind of earthly peace? It's very what? Temporary. Look at Israel's history of peace. Tell me if you can come up with a large time period where Israel was not in some kind of conflict. Where they weren't... uh, afraid of their borders or not even a nation at one point. Right now they fear daily at their borders. But um, what, they, what, they, what 
Nahum's looking at is to celebrate this message of peace no matter where you're at in life as far as when we look in the, in the, whether you're living in the Old Testament times, Gospel times, or now, there is the peace that we have through Christ. Whether we're looking ahead to the cross or back at the cross, the message is still the same. We can only have what the Lord is my salvation. Um, and notice what he says again in verse 15. Celebrate your feast, O Judah. What a great call. He's calling Israel to celebrate their national feasts, which all, which all are, are celebrations to the Lord. But sometimes we look at them as, as like almost like mournful, but they're celebrations to the Lord. They're not just feasts, they're festivals. Uh, I think that would be a better word to use sometimes. Um, look at, hold your finger here and go, let's go to Leviticus. And let's get an idea of what these feasts look like. Not in, in depth by no means, but just get a Leviticus chapter 23. And remember these, uh, let me give you a picture while you're turning to Leviticus 23. There was pilgrim, pilgrimages the males mostly had to make to Jerusalem. In order to do that, you had a freedom of travel because you all didn't always live in Jerusalem. By this time, especially the northern kingdom had been scattered and they didn't have the freedom to travel to Jerusalem. And God's basically saying, celebrate your feast. You therefore have the freedom to, to travel. I'm going to make sure you, your ways are, are, are free from foreign people to, to stop and thwart you from coming. Uh, during certain periods, there was a lot of... Um, High, uh, what do you call it? robberies, bandits kind of thing. These, these, remember, there's a hatred for the Jew. And God had to make sure that they could do their pilgrimage to worship again. Notice what it says in Leviticus 23, verse 1. We'll pick up and, and, and to see Israel worshiping again, you've got to understand their freedom is while they're worshiping, they're proclaiming their God, the only God to the world. So it says, and the Lord spoke again to Moses saying, verse 2, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. My appointed times are these. So it's pretty clear. God says, these are the times you are to celebrate. Firstly, he says, for six days work will be done. But on the seventh day there will be a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. You shall not do any work. It is the Sabbath to the Lord in, in all your dwellings. Secondly, he says, these are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. I was talking to my mom. We were talking about Rosh Hashanah this year. Rosh Hashanah is what? The Hebrew New Year. Biblically, what's the Hebrew New Year? I just gave it to you. You're allowed to read. It's an open book. It's what? It's when Passover is here. It says what? Very clearly, it says that in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. It says the first month. We look at the first month. We know when Passover and the, the, the Lord's resurrection time frame is. It's usually March, April, right? That's not September. So the biblical new year, it begins with what? Pesach, Passover, Passover. What's central to a new year? What do you celebrate? You celebrate the Lord's dealing with sin. And when we see later, and we get to the New Testament, Christ is our Passover. How do you begin your, your year? How do you begin? Do you begin looking first and foremost to the cross? That's kind of what they're saying. But he wants them to go back and celebrate that, which, which they've, They've, uh, I guess, hit and missed on the Passover. Uh, if you would want to do this, you'd go search from Genesis to Revelation how many Passovers were observed. You'll find out they missed uh, quite a few of them. And God paid a heavy price to them for missing some of them. And they missed also Jubilees and Sabbaths and so on and so forth. And God says, no, you can't do that. You can't just arbitrarily 
worship this way. God says, that I have set forth, um, if I want to say anything, a, a biblical calendar, how you are to live your life. Um, then on the 15th day of the same month, verse 6, there is to be the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do lib- laborious work. In other words, that first day of leaven, unleavened bread is also a special Sabbath. It's not, it probably uh, it depends on the calendar, the lunar cycle when it falls. We always think, oh, look, it'll fall on a Friday. <laughs> Just for them. It does not work that way in a lunar calendar. So remember, they're, they're dealing with a lunar calendar. Oh, probably a whole different class, but just think of that. But for seven days, verse 8, for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. So anyway, he's setting all these uh, what we call feast, feast days up, and he's saying, here's your calendar. Here's how you do this. And their calendar is set by what we call the, the uh, season. It's a seasonal calendar. Um, because the next one is the fir- Feast of first fruits. And if you look at it, take these time frames and plug it into Messiah and see what you're missing. Because I know about you, I'm thinking, I'm looking for the Feast of Trumpets, Right? What are we looking for? His, his return kind of thing. So um, probably, again, a class for another time. Go back to Nahum, and let's see how far we go. Oh, Fifteen minutes. I've got to get a clock that's more friendly. Now, at this time period, when we're dealing with the Assyrians, the king of Israel is a guy named Hezekiah. Hezekiah has placed in a, in, into action many, um, I don't want to say reforms, returns, I guess is the best way. He's dealt with getting rid of the high places, got swept away all the idolatry, um, inspired and supported the ministry of Isaiah. Um, uh, he became a... He tried to keep a biblically centered uh, Levitical priesthood, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, these reforms, and I, I, I don't want to say reforms because it says, oh, this is, it's going back to what God had set up. It's a return to, to a godly existence uh, was short-lived. That's the problem. How long will something last only as far as the leadership will go? So Hezekiah has a son named Manasseh who's just an evil person. Uh, and therefore when Manasseh came in and rose to the throne at a ripe old age of 12, he had around him, obviously, his own cohort, and this cohort obviously steered him to make decisions, because I don't think a 12-year-old could come up with some of these. Um, at least the 12-year-olds I've known can't. Um, he all, he... <clears throat> He basically supported a counter-revolution to what his father had set up. (laughs) Um, And therefore, that time of peace, that time of celebration of the feast, was very short-lived. Again, I believe because Nahum was saying, this what we have will be peace under the Messiah that we will have later. So I really think he's, he was looking for a true time of peace, what we would call the second advent, the real good news. You know, we always talk about the good news, the gospel, right? Gospel's great news, but there's better news than the great good news. There's great news, and he's coming back to be king, to rule and to reign, and to set up his own kingdom. Don't forget there's more good news, you know? Sometimes you say, oh, the gospel is the only good news. No, the Bible's full of good news. Um, and we are to bear the good news. We're back to that same place. To, um, uh, well, actually, I got a verse I, I, I want to look at. Look at Isaiah 41. I guess Isaiah deals with this a little bit. Let's look at Isaiah 41. We'll look at two sets of verses because I want to look at more good news. I guess it's, it's kind of hard to say that because some of us are so locked in. Oh, the good news is the gospel because it's good news and gospel. Well, gospel is good news. We've got to ask ourselves, oh, what good news are we talking about? Are we talking about the, gospel, the message of Christ and his crucifixion or the better news about Christ and his return? 
Aren't we supposed to look for His return? His soon and coming return? How many of us are looking ahead? I think that's one of the things Nahum was looking at. See, Israel, when the prophets were dealing with things, they didn't just have the first advent in mind. They had both advents in mind. They couldn't separate them. Um, chapter 41, Isaiah 41, verse 25, says, I have aroused one from the north, and he has come. From the rising of the sun, he will call on my name, on my name and he will come upon rulers as upon mortar. Even as the potter tr- uh, treads clay, who has declared this from the beginning that we might know, or the former times that we may say, he is right. Surely there is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who proclaims. Surely there is no one who heard the words. Formerly I said to Zion, behold, here they are. And to Jerusalem, I will give uh, a messenger of good news. But when I look, there is no one. There is no counselor among them who, I, who if I ask, can give the answer. Behold, all of them are false. Their works are worthless. Their molten images are wind and emptiness. So he was looking for someone to bear that news. And the very next chapter talks about Christ, the servant of the Lord, who will behold my servant whom I will uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring justice to the goyim, the nations. And what are we dealing with in Nahum? The nations. Uh, Assyria as a representative of that. And he will cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. Turn over to uh, Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. And Isaiah 60. um, I don't know who said it to me. I don't know if it was in seminary somewhere. Isaiah 66 chapters. Isn't that amazing? Each one of those books represent each book in the Bible. I go, Problematic. Because Isaiah didn't know he had 66 chapters, just so you know. So he couldn't write, oh, this book represents Genesis. This book represents Exodus. First, and, first, and second of all, what represents Isaiah other than Isaiah itself? So that it, but it's kind of interesting. It helps you remember there's 66 chapters. But this chapter specifically has a point about it that kind of deals a little bit with the revelation aspect because it's about the future of Israel which also has a Romans aspect at the end of, towards the end of Romans. Verse 1 says, Arise and shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, a deep darkness of the peoples. Um, the, but the Lord will rise upon you. His glory will appear upon you. And nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes uh, round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar and your daughters will be carried in their arms. Then you, you will see and be radiant in your heart, the thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you and the wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you. Uh, your, your, your young camels of Midian and Ephah, all, all, who, all those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense. Sound familiar? <laughs> and bear good news of the praises of the Lord. And this is talking about the millennial kingdom. So again, we'll, we'll have those same significance when, the, when they brought the gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the child Jesus. It was significance again of, of who he was. That king to be uh, honored. Um, I promise I get somewhere, so we're going to get through one verse, I guess. So we'll go back to Nahum verse 15. We'll, Nahum chapter 1 verse 15. It's hard because when you go into this, you say, man, there's so many verses I could plug in here. This little book is so profound. And when we look at these books, um, I don't know if I'll ever be back in some of these minor prophets. But when they were originally written... Jesus hadn't come. The light of the New Testament hadn't, hadn't been there. Um, so when he says things, we have to find support, and God has supported it immensely. I only can um, envision the original recipients, what they might have understood. And as we look at the end of verse 15, he says, He is cut off completely. Now, it's kind of interesting, because we're talking about Sennacherib being cut off completely. But who's he a picture of here? We're talking about the good news of the feet of him who brought that good news, told it on the mountaintops. And then we have a picture of this guy will be cut off. And I really think Sennacherib is giving us a picture of Satan. 
Satan will be totally cut off by what? What will, what will cut off uh, Satan? Uh, when we talk about a time of true peace, a time of the feast of Israel restored where your God reigns, we're talking also about Satan's total demise. Now, we've read about it. Genesis 3.15 tells us that Satan is doomed, basically, that he will strike at the heel of, of the child of this woman, but that this child will crush Satan's head. But that had to unfold through history. And everybody says, well, at the cross, the cross did Satan in. Absolutely. I agree with you. But he's still here. He's still around. He still plagues us in many fashions. We know the end of the story. He's lost. He's doomed. But there's going to be a point in, in time, in literal time, where he'll be cut off. And the idea of cut off is, is a word of circumcision. Where he would cut off part of the uh, male and toss it out. Get rid of it. And that's what we're looking at, the idea of cutting off of Satan and entirely wiping him out. Um, and we look at these verses further down the road where the Messiah will once again, his feet will land here on earth and split mountains. And his good news and how beautiful being the good news he is, he says, I've come to rule and to reign. And I want us to understand in order for him to do that, the adversary has to be done away with. Look with me. At, uh, let's go to a psalm. I think this may help a little. Go to Psalm 96. Then I'll kind of introduce chapter 2, and obviously we will pick it up at some point next week. Psalm 96. You know, every time the Bible says sing, (laughs) I feel so inept. (laughs) I said, Lord, if you want me to sing, why didn't you give me the notes? (laughs) And I always get back, I did. You're just flat on all of them. (laughs) But notice what it says, though, who it's addressed to. It's kind of interesting. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. So it's not just addressed to us in a singularity. It's harmonious. So I look at it like this. The choir is going to be large and drown me out. (laughs) It was really neat because I I wasn't a choir for a while. I know some of you are going to be shocked. Um, But I was surrounded by a perfect baritone and a great bass. So I was like, I was either drowned out or, you know, I kind of leaned my own way and I could hear him. But when you have a, 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 a range of voices in a large choir kind of thing, it's beautiful. It's beautiful because you don't hear the guys. Hey, the guy in the fifth row, the, the guy with, back then I had a beard. The guy with a beard, you're really flat. <laughs> really? No kidding. Tell me something. But listen to what it's saying, though. Keep this vision in you. That the sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim in this singing effect, the proclamation will be good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among the people. So when we're singing, who we focused on? His primary focal of all our messages as we sing forth His praises. Look what verse 4 says. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. I guess we did that one, right? That is a song. (laughs) Uh, And he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, uh, worthless idols, vain idols. uh, My my side column says non-existent things. So I even like that. They're not idols. They're just not. it's, It's a piece of wood. But it says, but the Lord made the heavens. See what the psalmist so often go back to God is the creator God is the creator if he created everything from nothing again you're just easy your life is easy for him plain and simple um but verse six is neat too it's a splendor and majesty are before him strength or beauty are, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary um just a beautiful psalm um and a lot of them are, I mean, most of them are anyway. And, and, and as we focus on them, we, we always see the psalmist, as whoever the psalmist may be, is always focusing on God. God. Here's who you are in the midst of my little crisis. You're, you're God. So let's go to chapter 2. Go to Nahum chapter 2. Chapter 2. 
just momentarily, I have a foe called the clock. Um, again, as we, we looked at chapter 1, we finished with verse 15. And I, and I said, did it finish chapter 1 or does it begin chapter 2? Because the Hebrew Bible says that's verse 1 of chapter 2. Or does it stand alone? And I think, I think all of them are involved. All those ideas are involved. Um, and as we look at this, Israel at this time, even though we just read what we read in the psalmist, has issues. Their issues have, have again under Manasseh and his, uh, I guess, underling, his son Ammon, um, both of them make nice with Assyria. Um, and it, therefore, by making nice with Assyria, they begin to adopt their gods back in. You can't make nice with a people without accepting something of theirs. There's got to be a give and take. That's why I'm always fearful when, when any nation is making a compact with any nation or an agreement. What is it going to cost us? What is it going to bring in? What is it going to allow us to be involved in? Not only what we give them. Oh, what we're giving them is so much greater. No, because that evil comes in. And in Israel's case, the evil came in in this uh, contract that they had. Um, and not only to the point that they brought their gods in, not only to the point that they worshipped their gods, but they even built altars that Assyria had designed for their gods in Israel. I just have a problem with that. I don't want to ever see an altar, a maiden in, you know, in Assyria come up. What? God gave them. You know what's fascinating? God gave them a blueprint of how he was to be worshipped and gave them the exact dimensions from heaven. Here's what I want. Here's how I want to be worshipped. Here's what it is. And they said, oh, Assyria looks better. Do you see what's going on? They, how God would react to that, how evil... That is, um, so we're going to get descriptions of uh, the the details. I guess the details of the destruction that will happen to Nineveh, um, and God uses a lot of interesting terms. Um, and what happens is, here's what chapter two does, and we'll pick it up next week. God's going to say, "Here's what you've done, Nineveh. This will be done to you." What do we call that? The law of what? Yeah, retribution. We also call it what you sow, you shall reap. And Assyria set the standard. Here's what we've done to other people. And God says, now that you've done all those things to those other people, here's what I'm going to do to you. Because this is what you've done to other people. Those law, of whatever, whichever. I like the law of what you sow, you shall reap. Because the Bible says that. And it says it in so many different ways. Um, we'll look at some of those verses as we deal with it next week. Any questions or any thoughts on what we've covered tonight? We're good? Good, good, good. Okay.